Welcome to our ComposeCast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? Oh, I'm doing well. Uh, I think I'm doing a lot better than everyone who's mitigating against Log4j right now. How are you doing over there? Yeah, I uh, I am looking into that too, but luckily have not had that become my day to day. So, but for those who have had that become their day to day, it's been quite overwhelming. Um, so I hear. Yeah, so discovered in China. I'll leave that statement at that. Discovered in China by I guess some developers at Alibaba. Um, the Apache log4j library has an exploit, right? Who would have thought in logging, you're going to be able to remotely execute code, but I guess somehow, some way we've done it. Uh, I love, I, I posted this updated show note link, show notes link here, if you want to take a look, but essentially it's boiled down in very layman's terms. Um, what it looks like is basically log 4j the log the way logging the logging is occurring or happening what's happening is log 4j uses a ton of variables for dates uh they used a name as an example and it just kind of injects them in to logs mm-hmm. when the application is you know printing out logs to the console well sure enough these variables can basically be exploited uh i did have one high level content thing right here uh as a i loved this quote of basically describing how a code base works and this is why i said it's very layman's and i'm gonna read it right here imagine you have the task of making coffee for your partner every morning a simple task on the face of it but breaking it down you need more and more components you need a cup you need water hot water you need coffee and you may need milk and sugar And then it says, you don't go to the pottery and make a new cup every morning, nor do you milk a cow or pick and dry coffee beans and then grind them up. You certainly don't pump water from a well, heat it, and then combine everything. That would be incredibly time and labor intensive. Instead, if you're like most people, you buy a remade remade cup, buy prepackaged coffee, milk, and sugar. You turn on the tap for pre-filtered water. You combine them in a matter that suits your, your needs. So... I I love that code example just because people don't realize, yeah, you're taking code from everywhere. And unfortunately, what happened is Apache just published exploitable code. So that's kind of what we're looking at and remediating against remediating against right now. So Yeah, no, I, I certainly appreciate you reading that. That that kind of puts it into context, you know, what is a library? A library is, you know, someone else's work uh, that, that you can appropriate to do the work that you need to do. Um, Now, why a piece of login software uh, needs to be executing remote code is beyond me. It shouldn't. Uh, However, you know, this is just, you know, I was was thinking, I I actually heard this discussed in two separate podcasts of mine already. Um, But I was was thinking about it going through it. I'm like, look, the amount of complexity that modern software development has is like putting together like one of those Lego sets that you get that's like, you know, a bajillion amount of pieces and it's like part of like other sets like and and what these security researchers do is they try to find inaccuracies like if someone used a a slanted piece as a little workaround instead of a, a a fully square piece and therefore some kind of like mutant ant that's three times smaller than the regular ant can get into this one little crack right and we got security researchers breathing down our throats saying look this this uh, mutant ant type thing can get in here i'm like well we have you know anti-ant you know we've we sprayed the house <laughs> for ants so there's not going to be any ants like we have mitigating factors in place um but we we see these brought to our attention so often because people are brought brought to the center it's so low level and ingrained in what we're doing it's like look, i get it like i i, I get oh, that yeah. there's a possibility this could be exploited but the you know th- that's that's probably not going to be happening um unfortunately when when stuff like this comes around it's like someone just you know knocked a hole in your battleship kind of thing so it's a it's a it's a different 
if it's a, it's a different perspective on this. Totally. And with this receiving a what is it, the miter score of ten out of ten on the severity yeah. level, uh, I would recommend going out and patching or just auto fixing. I even saw a tweet out there that said, uh, "I'm not a developer, but I'm." writing code right now to fix basically this vulnerability just going in the code base and disabling logging <laughs> i heard that uh cloudera is taking the approach to uh, go through their software stack they, they have written a script that they're pushing out to customers that goes through their software stack and every single jar that they find in their software stack they decompile they take out the class they like remove the vulnerable class recompile it into the jar and then replace the old jar with the the new one that's impressive yeah uh, it, it really is impressive. it really is uh and and unfortunately you know a lot of the talking points around this is is going to be that yeah, it's it's deployed everywhere which is unfortunate um the the other talking point is going to be you know why wasn't this you know funded right and and uh ironically enough uh, in one of the Jupiter Broadcasting podcasts, uh, I think it was their their systems administration podcast. They were talking about, well, just c- create a community of NFT holders that you know, are incentivized to. And I was like, well, we're going to stop there and uh, hang on. We'll talk about that later. But you know, that being a foreshadowing into what we're going to dive into in our, our grab bag, you know, there is this conversation happening about um, how can we fund the kind of research and development that needs to happen, you know, because going back to the Lego analogy, you have people putting together these amazing looking sets. I mean, you got like the Death Star, you've got, you know, all these, I, I just remember that one vividly, but like, you know, all these complicated Lego sets, I guess the Millennium Falcon 2 was pretty intense but imagine if someone put out those plans for free right um how would you kind of incentivize them to make sure that there weren't any issues with it right or that it didn't degrade over time or was structurally you know something something bad could happen to it how how do you how do you give them the opportunity to take their time and be cautious about it and, and give them a good ecosystem to operate within you know and and a lot of that has to do with incentivization and and how they how they monetize what they're doing and and a lot of this conversation has shifted to be around that well this would have been found you know were we to have um taken everyone who is uh, using open source as a a back end to to contribute back to it and and it's like yeah, that's that's great in in idea, but um, you know, people are using so many different things. It's it's hard to say where to start. Um, and that's something that we've tackled as well. We're like, you know, where where do we start with this? And 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 from the get go, we're like, w- w- you know, Jack, you and I both believe in open source software, right? And and we we saw this too. We're like, well, pff, there's all these applications that aren't, you know, they they have they have donations, right? You can right. you can certainly donate. But there's no kind of revenue model. There's no sustainability. There's no, you know, and granted the sustainability is kind of in the open source ethos, but like, how can we, how can we kind of contribute? Uh, and, and the way we decided to do this is like, look, the applications that we host, right, we basically profit share. I mean, in, in a, in right. a kind of right. very low level kind of way, it's like, we're, we, you know, I, what do we say? Something like fifty percent of of net profit, right, goes back into the the applications um, to the percentage of which they're used, you know, stuff like that. So, so we we have an idea that you know, since w- these services are something that are provided by us, and and sure, you know, we're doing the work to get it up, to maintain it, to troubleshoot it, spin up the infrastructure, we're, we're paying for that. Um, on the back end, there is also other dues that we have to pay, right? And and I don't want to be neglectful of that. Um, so taking inventory of the stuff we use, in, uh, including Ansible, including Docker, you know, and, and those are things that we would have to kind of parse out and, and itemize out and say, hey, this is, this is, these are the dues we have to pay in right. order to make this an ethical type of company, right? And, and I could not operate in a company which didn't, didn't do, do that, that. Yeah. right? Um, I, I certainly couldn't operate one. Definitely. And I, I think speaking of some of the services we offer, some of the, some of the other items that are out there, uh, 
Very interesting one from Nextcloud. Uh, not a great look. <laughs> not a great look for them. Uh, they pushed out a 3.4.0 release for their desktop clients. And unfortunately, what ended up happening with this desktop client version was it just continued to pull f- files from the server. Now, it's been closed since, but this occurred right on two weeks ago. And I unfortunately have uh, someone I know that this happened to. They were running NextCloud, and basically they pulled down this newer version. They continue to just basically sync files. So it's been closed from... It's been closed now, but just kind of an unfortunate one to see because it, it you kind of lose that trust, right? After you start to see... This desktop client, they've got it out there. They've had it working for so long. It's been, I use the desktop client. I think it's fine. I think it's great. Mm-hmm. You see it, it just, they push out 3.4 and, you know, basically you're just killing, you're filling up disk space on your own workstation. You basically have to re-clean everything that's on uh, your desktop because it's just continuing to sync. So a little bit unfortunate to see, but I know they'll bounce right back. And this is why I never deploy dot zero bug fix releases to production. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, we we even at Orcompose we stay uh, minor release back just yep. to prevent from these exact issues from happening. Exactly, exactly. Because I've I've seen it all too often. I've seen it all too often, right? And and it it could be one of many different things, oh, including totally. your bash script not being item potent. Um, which I dredged up our, our next article from uh, 2019, but it had just surfaced uh, in the uh, circles that I run in. And, and I, I thought it was a really, really good article. It, it laid out some things that I've been doing, but really never took the time to systematize uh, and, and, and really just be aware of, right? So um, item potency for those of you don't, who don't know is, is something that, you know, kind of configuration management strives for. Um, the definition that they quote here is denoting an element of a set which is unchanged in value when multiplies are otherwise operated on by itself, uh, which means in the software world, if I run like a deploy script and then I run that same deploy script again, I can run it again without other stuff being overwritten. Right stuff doesn't get mangled up or you know we we don't plan on only ever having that script run once right because that's that's just a recipe for failure right because stuff happens right uh, it, it, it stuff happens in the most inconvenient time so being able to run it whenever we need is helpful and and that's kind of the approach that we take uh, especially with our you know um, our compose rules right they they are meant to be all item potent. Now, to be fair, they do act on services because we do want like a, a, a kick to those services. We do want them to restart. But at the end, you should end up, if you go into it with a working system, you should end up with a working system in the exact same way. Uh, so that being the goal of item potency, how does Bash achieve that? Well, there's a couple of tricks here. Um, so in order to create an empty file, bash has the touch command, uh, which if the file already exists, will simply update the mo- file's modification time and not over override anything else in it. Um, creating a directory with uh, make dir p and a, a ton of other uh, cool things here. Um, the one that I wasn't aware of is the mount point command um so that's that's not something and and that's something i've been struggling with a lot you know is it is it mounted do i do stuff to it do i try to you know and that's that's something that i think i will be taking away from this because you know going through the rest of these the author uh here is thinking in the in the same way that that i am uh so i definitely want to see if I can't start using that because I mean it's it's a good way to think it's it's a good methodology to use whenever I'm creating scripts is to say hey this should be item potent point blank totally 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 I'll tell you what I had um something I was running recently it was to clean 
files on my server. And one of the... Uh, regretfully, one of the folders got way too big. Sure enough, I have this script to clean it up when that happens. But basically, it was so big, I couldn't get RM to even work on it. So I had to pull the old <laughs> remove the whole directory itself and then copy back in the files that I needed to copy back in. It was so unfortunate. It could have been completely avoided. Now, where does this link back to item potency? I, of course, wrote up a, a small little bash script where if it happens again on the same directory, which I'm sure it will, I at least have that ability to now, all right, well, what did you do last time? Okay, you can do this to yep. go back and run the same thing over again. We have we do have a few community updates. I did not include it. There is an update for Run Deck. There are two updates, and I can only assume these are for Log4j. Just based on the fact that Run Deck is a Java application, I'm... Is it? It is. Uh, runs off Tomcat, Apache Tomcat. Okay. Uh, and then it's Java-based. So I can only assume they pushed out uh, releases for, I think, 3.4.7 and their 3.3 series. So okay. I can only assume both of these are related to remediations. No, that's right. That's right. You're right. You're right. Yep. I didn't see any release notes uh, I was fresh to it. It looked like when I was, I went, I went down to, I went to Git, GitHub to pull down the releases, check releases, and sure enough, they were fresh, eight hours new. There was nothing on the site that had mentioned it. That's right, because I was, I was looking at that, and I looked at that a bit ago, uh, and obviously, like you said, it was just fresh. Um, and then also this morning, there was more disclosures or, or you know, more vulnerabilities. Uh, announce or something like that. So I'm waiting for the fallout of that uh, before we look into stuff. But I think we were talking about in the activity section, we were talking how we obfuscate a lot of the variables uh, that we pass through, right. right? And like, why would someone do that? You know, we're, we're the only ones that have permission to see that. Why would we obfuscate it? Well, this well, is why. <laughs> this is why. This is why. I mean, this is defense in depth right and in depth means at every level that you can set up your systems to be secure and right. if obfuscating our passwords makes it just a little bit more secure perfect perfect yeah the other two we had here smaller i'm only going to briefly touch on them vault warden got a release it looks like it was just bug fixes and patches uh, that were pushed out He's still continuing to harp on, and I will harp on this as well. If you are self-hosting the image or pulling down that image from Docker Hub, quit using Bitwarden RS. That's your final warning. Use the Vault Warden image because that's what's out there now. And then the second update we had was for Bookstack. Again, just another minor one, but security releases. It sounded like this one, it, it, he kind of snuck it in there. It sounded like... Uh, <laughs> If the public API, if the public role was provided API access, then the API could be accessed in certain scenarios by non-authenticated users. So he kind of snuck that one in there, but it's kind of a big fix that he patched. So nothing else I saw. I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add for community updates. Well, I was just looking at that same notification from him uh, in that. Uh, from excuse me from the vault warden team uh, in that we in order to pull down the image please start pulling down the vault warden vault image warden rather image. than the, right. the bit warden rs one um because i was going through and upgrading our migrating uh excuse me our services so 3.4 actually got released uh late in the night and uh was being rolled out after a couple bug fixes uh to the rest of the the application so um uh what got updated so accounting got updated um book stack uh bitwarden uh and nextcloud um all got version bumps and you can see that in the stable 3.4 release uh remind me to put those in the show notes as well and uh the what was the other thing 
Something about portal. Oh yeah, the the portal fix that we had talked about for the uh, in it for the zombie processes yeah. had to be back uh, cherry picked and backported into the stable three out of four release. So once that uh, once that was backported, that all worked uh, like a charm. The only thing uh, I ran into with that is that uh, some of the table names in the accounting database, uh, the config after migration was looking for a different prefix than what was there, so the fix was just to to update the prefix for it to be looking for. Um, but new instances didn't have that issue, so um, only existing instances would have to go in and, and change that config value, otherwise it's, it's all gravy. Uh, the only other update I had uh, this cycle uh, was our content walkthrough playlists, and that's because this took me way longer than it should have, than I wanted it to, uh, to create these. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of give a little inside baseball on those. So, so what we wanted to do is, is we wanted to be able to provide what's known in the industry as an ethical bribe in order to get people to sign up for the mailing list. Usually that comes in the form of, hey, you know, download our white paper and use your email to sign up in order to get access to it, you know, or, or, you know, it's, do this or do that or you know we have this 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 piece of content for you if you give us your email address and and that's that's known in in sales and marketing as an ethical bribe right um so we want to have one in our back pocket as well this has been something i've been thinking about for a while since we put out the podcasts why don't we cut the shows up into sections and that's been something right. we've ex been experimenting with you know jack's been really great at taking that on and saying yeah i'll take the the full episode i'll cut it in in shot cut and, and and do a video edit of it uh, and then we'll put those those out um so now we have those those sections going forward um why don't we just cut up our previous videos and like say pull out all of our Bitwarden content and and then that way if someone wants to learn more about Bitwarden or the the takes that we have on Bitwarden um, or the advice that we have on Bitwarden we can just point them to this playlist that will go through only all of our Bitwarden stuff including my integration sessions um, you know our your your integration discussions you know during the podcast and we clip those together into into a single playlist and and that flows very nicely um, and that's that's especially helpful for anyone who's who we're onboarding as, as a client you know says so, so, hey I want to I want to learn more about Bitwarden. I'm like well so we have several hours worth of content um, skim through these and then we can start from square two instead of square one Right, so we always we always want to be able to maximize uh, the time that we spend uh, because I think time is going to be our most constrained resource right. uh, going forward and and already. But uh, if we can if we can jumpstart that uh, by by providing this, I'm more than happy to. Uh, so that's that's going to be something available um, upon subscription to the mailing list or you know onboarding as a as a client of, of compositional enterprises, um, which I would hope at that point you'd already be set up to the mailing list. Right. But either way, um, uh, we we do have those available. Now, the the, the cool thing was, Jack, I'd, I'd given you that that script to to cut up uh, yeah. the the episodes. Quick, uh, yeah. The the unfortunate thing is there is a thing known as keyframes in videos, and these keyframes kind of sync up the the audio and video, right? So what you want to do is, if you're going to cut something, you want to cut it on a keyframe. Key now, sure. when you export a video, it will re-encode all the keyframes for you. So, like if you're editing it in shot cut, you don't have to worry about keyframes because it'll it'll do all that magic for you. But if I'm importing a video and I want to say cut it here, cut it here, do a fade, and then and then concatenate them together, if I'm not doing those on keyframes, it's going to be all out of whack and nothing's going to work, right? So what I had to do is I had to re-encode everything with the correct keyframes, which I put at one second. So you're inserting a keyframe every, every second, one second. Yeah. of this video, which took forever because I went through most of our backlog. Most of our backlog ends up being Rundeck, Bitwarden, Canboard, or Nextcloud, right? Because those are the services that we've gone through. Those are the videos that I have for the integration session. So they, they pair well in a playlist and having those those 
many, many videos in our backlog. I had to import all of them. I just had a for loop going through and re-encoding each one of them. Yeah. I think it took my desktop something like a day and a half to record re re-encode, re-encode. all of them. Uh, and that was only after I had figured out that was the issue when I was scratching my head saying, why isn't the script What's working? What's going on? Yeah. Er my GERD, it worked for me yesterday on the same computer. So trying to figure that out, then re-encode them, then get them all uploaded and categorized and put in playlists. It was just, it was a lot bigger task than I thought it was going to be, but I'm so happy. I'm so happy to have that. they're that out there. there. Oh, yeah. yeah. And... And there are other things coming down the pipe, but yeah, to have that up there, I was I was very happy. So if you're not incentivized by now, you should be, because that's how you're going to be able to get all this content, is if you sign up for the mailing list. And one thing I like about this is that it's not like the videos aren't out there for people, but we're curating it. Once right. again, it's your time to go through and cherry pick all those out, in order, by the way. Uh, to go through and, and watch all of them. This is nice and already and straightforward. Displayed. Yeah. Saves time. It's already so. there. Yep. Yep. So mailing list, if you don't already know, is at arcompose.com. Uh, right on the front page. Please, if you're, you're listening to this and you haven't done so yet, go ahead and just sign up. First name, email address. We're going to let you know when cool stuff like this is coming out. And for all of our content and any kind of updates we have. So 